12 classes. 12 class guides now in one super long video. I've put all my class guides together and cut out the fluff and the nonsense and the rambling, as well as updated a mistake I made in one of the class guides. So you'll have to let me know in the comments if you can pick that out, but let's go. Before we get into these, let me know your thoughts on these like supercut style videos and which class is your favorite. All right, let's go. Playing as a Barbarian is definitely a melee focused class. Now you have that rage mechanic, which will increase the overall damage that your melee and improvised weapons will do, as well as giving you advantage on strength checks and saving throws. But the main benefit here is that they have an insane amount of potential melee damage that they can do because of their class ability, Reckless Attack, which gives you advantage on your attack rolls. So you've got a higher chance of actually hitting. The trade-off here is that it gives your enemies advantage on you. And typically because you have a low Lower armor class because most barbarians won't actually wear armor because of their armored or unarmored defense while you are not wearing armor your armor class equals 10 plus your dex modifier plus your constitution modifier so as you level up as a barbarian and gain extra feats to increase your overall constitution or dexterity or gear that can do the same thing your armor class will increase that way typically rather than wearing armor though you can wear armor because you have proficiencies you could also actually just pop on a shield as well because that doesn't technically count as armor but the main modifier here for barbarian is strength and you'll definitely be focusing on that so when you're picking a race the options here are really up to you based on your role playing perspective but if you're looking to min max the taller classes are the better options here like the elf tiefling drow human gith half elf dragonborn and half orc because they all have that standard movement speed in terms of like the best i would say the half orc is potentially the best because of relentless endurance so when you are downed instead of being downed you regain one hp which is a great like counterbalance to say unarmored defense and having that lower armor class as well as reckless attack with enemies often having advantage on the barbarian so you've got that way to stay up plus savage attacks is a huge buff so if you do critical hit it's triple damage rather than double and because you have advantage on a lot of your attack rolls you've got a higher chance of that actually happening as well so you can definitely trigger that effect much more often so half orcs as barbarians are really really strong best skills here for a barbarian athletics is the only strength skill and constitution is always going to be high as a barbarian so there isn't really anything in that line either but i'd probably go perception and survival so you can see things a little bit better in the open world like hidden caches and buttons trap chests that sort of a thing for the background soldier and outlander maybe but it's really up to you in terms of the role playing experience for the ability points here you really only need to focus on strength dexterity and constitution they're the only main important stats now the recommended does put some stats into wisdom which you can use for that sort of perception survival stuff but if you're looking to min max i wouldn't sort of worry about it too much at level three you will pick a subclass between the berserker wild heart and wild magic the shorthand here is that these subclasses will essentially buff your rage mechanic into one specific way for the berserker it's like leaning into like the frenzy of the rage for the wild heart you will imbue your rage with some sort of like animal effects and the wild magic will imbue it with a wild magic effect so it does depend a little bit on what sounds most interesting to you though i would say that berserker and wild heart are probably the two stronger ones here wild heart gets a little bit of an edge in terms of conversational and like open world aspects because it gives you speak with animals which is actually really beneficial to do because you can learn heaps of interesting things from that plus the bestial hearts are really worthwhile in terms of giving you different effects whether that be to say the bear heart which will allow you to restore some of your health which is beneficial or the wolf which would give your allies advantage on melee attack rolls but i personally think the tiger is probably the best option here based on what i've tested so it will give you an increased jump distance but the tiger bloodlust is the main thing here which is like a essentially a cleave that you can use every turn like the cleave weapon attack but you can actually use this much more often it will hit three enemies and also trigger bleed on them and then you can buff your bleeding effects on enemies at level six with the animal aspect of the tiger which will allow you to add your strength strength modifier to attack rolls against bleeding and poison enemies or you could also go into say the wolverine which when you attack a bleeding or poison enemy you can maim them for a turn as well so there's a lot of synergy between that option as well 
The rest of the leveling process for the Barbarian is pretty straightforward. You don't make a huge amount of choices here except for picking your feats. But at level 4, you'll pick your first feat. And I think you should go Savage Attacker here. So when making weapon attacks, you roll your damage dice twice and pick the highest result. It will further increase your overall damage output. The other option which you could either pick up first if you prefer to, but is hugely worthwhile picking up, especially if you're wielding a great weapon, like a two-handed weapon, is Great Weapon Master. So when you land a critical hit or kill a target with a melee weapon attack, you can make another melee weapon attack as a bonus action that turn, which is great because any time that you can attack again is just like a huge benefit in this game. And because Barbarians will often be dealing so much damage, especially when you combine, say, Savage Attacks, which we just talked about, or say you go Half Orc for their own Savage Attack buff that you get, plus you've got Reckless Attack to make sure you're hitting those targets and all this other stuff and the extra attack you get at level 5, chances are almost every turn you're going to kill something as a Barbarian so you'll trigger that effect very often so you'll often be able to attack again a third time in that one turn which is very very beneficial great weapon master also has like the all-in effect so you can deal an actual 10 damage to enemies with the trade-off of minus five to your attack rolls which obviously because of reckless attack you can roll those dice twice anyway so it's not going to be as much of an issue but it's a fantastic option so some general tips for the barbarian playing this class now you definitely want to be in melee range and getting there as fast as you can is beneficial so you may want to use your action at the start of combat to dash and try and get in the thick of things because you want to be in the middle of enemies so you can cleave them so you can hit them and hit many at each turn as possible obviously you do want to use your bonus action to enable rage when you do have the option to do so in the spellbook screen you should turn on the reaction so that if you are going to miss an attack you can actually turn this option on for reckless attacks so before it actually hits or misses it'll inform you that you're going to miss and it'll say would you like to enable reckless attack and then you can hit yes and so you always make sure you're actually going to hit enemies or you know most likely right it doesn't guarantee it's going to hit but you gain advantage so you get to roll that dice again otherwise if you're not using your bonus action you can coat your weapon into some sort of an oil or poison which will trigger the effect on that when you do actually swing the weapon as an action so you can use it up in that way you could also choose to wear armor and in the early stages of the game it's definitely viable because you do have light and medium armor proficiencies you could do so it'll probably level out your armor class higher higher than it would but as you sort of level up and you gain benefits or you say with Carlac, for example, right, if you can respec her and change her ability points just to line up a little bit better because hers aren't like perfectly aligned. But if you change them so that your strength, your con, and your dex are all those positive numbers, then you can definitely get that armor class a bit higher. But you could just wear light and medium armor until you can get to that point, or say you pick like the ability improvement or something like that as the alternative. Having someone say in melee range with you, like in my case, on my paladin is here, or just having ways to support your barbarians because they will take damage is a good option like whether that be with healing or ways to avoid damage coming from to them to say increase their armor class with shield of faith or something like that there's definitely options because you will expect to take damage as a barbarian like because of the, most enemies will have advantage on you so you won't get a lot of misses with barbarians like when enemies swing against them compared to some of the other classes they're much more of like a dps sort of damage focused melee class compared to say the fighter or the paladin or something like that that can sort of tank hits a little bit better you can definitely tank hits as a barbarian like don't get me wrong and there are ways to obviously you know heal yourself but just be mindful of that that you probably will take damage more than some of the other classes because of the advantage that enemies often have on you So the Paladin itself is more focused on a support class and they are devoted to their oath, which we're going to get into detail in a little bit. Now, they do have full armor proficiencies for light, heavy and medium armor, as well as shield, martial and simple weapons. So you've got plenty of options in terms of what sort of a kit you're actually using in terms of your weapons and that sort of a thing. Plus, they can actually cast spells as well as have some good healing options. So they fit a great flexible role as sort of a support, maybe a tank, maybe a martial focused Paladin. So a lot of flexibility in how you want to play a paladin now their primary stat is strength which is great for a melee focused class like this however as a paladin you need to pay attention to your charisma as well as charisma is your spell casting modifier so any spells that you cast it will be using charisma rather than strength when picking a race as a paladin you've got a few options here really you can go anything like it's entirely up to you and your role playing desires but you should be thinking about the racial speed so something like an elf tiefling drow human gith half elf dragonborn and half orc are the ones that have like the most racial speed in terms of just their movement speed because you will need to get into melee range as a paladin often to actually 
attack targets. You can do some damage from range. It's, you know, it is doable, but it's just something to think about that you will need to get to the target. So having a class that has a higher just general movement speed is important, but you don't need to worry too much about any of the like racial proficiencies in terms of weapons and that sort of a thing, because the Paladins have all of those proficiencies basically inbuilt. One thing I will mention is that the half orc is a great option because of relentless endurance. So if you're downed, instead of being downed, you regain one health. Also savage attack. So giving your crits triple damage dice is like a massive buff but also you can combo that with the critical divine smite reaction so adding even more damage on top of that is a really good benefit for something like that if you're trying to say min max your paladin in terms of your subclasses there are four options but only three options that are available in the character creator now the ancient and devotion are the most similar as they're both sort of a good paladin basically but when you're picking a subclass here you're really defining your oath and your oath tenants now, the Oath Tenants are essentially what you need to stick to as that Paladin to keep your subclass and that subclass's benefits. If you break your Oath, you'll become an Oath Breaker Paladin, which is a entirely different subclass. It's that fourth option. So the Ancient subclass is more based around the healing aspects and you gain healing radius as a bonus action. You can heal the allies around you. Devotion is another sort of good Paladin with Holy Rebuke. So as an action, you can call upon your Oath to grant an ally Vengeful Aura to deal radiant damage to them whenever they're hit. Out of these two like good subclasses the devotion is definitely the weaker one i've spent most of my time with the devotion and most of the footage that you're seeing is a devotion paladin here but the ancient is definitely the stronger one because your holy rebuke is an action now when this sort of breaks it down you want to use that action to actually attack in combat or use something else rather than holy rebuke so as like the main part of a devotions kit you won't use it that much and it's only a little bit of extra damage to ever the target that it hits it does change some of the other subclass options as you do level up that you'll get access to as well but Oath of the Ancients is definitely the stronger one of like the good paladin options because you can cast healing radiance as a bonus action so you can use that bonus action and then still attack so it doesn't feel like you're sort of wasting your turn on just these sort of smaller spells when you've got plenty of other spells and stuff in your kit that you can use Oath of Vengeance is sort of like the evil paladin they sort of have their own view of what righteousness is but Inquisitor's Might is what they get here which you and your allies weapons deal additional radiant damage and you can daze enemies for one turn this is also a bonus action again it's a fantastic option to use especially if you have like a melee partner in combat say you're running Karlak like i am you can use that for both of you to get that sort of a benefit now the oathbreaker paladin is as mentioned you have to break one of the tenants for the other three to get access to the oathbreaker now the oathbreaker is sort of a necrotic damage focused paladin you get spiteful suffering which gives you necrotic damage as an action it suffers from the same downside as the devotion but separate to them, you also get some necrotic based spells plus control undead and dreadful aspects. So the Oathbreaker does have a lot of good things going for it, especially if you're looking to be sort of that evil focus sort of paladin compared to Oath of Vengeance and you don't want to have an Oath. But the Oath does play a role in your role playing because you'll have to stick to it if you want to stay as that subclass or it's just worth calling out. The best skills for a paladin, really strength is the main ability, which doesn't have a lot of skills, but it does allow you to jump further and move objects in the world, which can come in handy. But I'd be looking at the charisma skill skills for a paladin so something like persuasion performance intimidation and deception because charisma is your spell casting modifier this is the same for your background though you can sort of pick something that's more based around your role playing aspects if you do choose to so the leveling up process as a paladin there's a couple of specific things that i want to call out first is at level two which is when the paladin really starts to succeed so you get access to divine smite which will spend a skill slot to add radiant damage to your damage effect now this can also also be used as a reaction to then add divine smite as a reaction effect to a critical hit which will then add that radiant damage which will add heaps of damage to that effect which i highly recommend you've also get access to a fighting style which is where you sort of decide what your paladin is going to be whether you're going to be defensive dueling great weapon fighting or protection i personally think that protection is a really good option for like a tank build which is what i'm going for for my oath of ancients paladin that we're sort of looking at here in this footage when picking the spells that you get access to here i would be looking at something like shield of faith to add armor class to your allies compelled jewel is really good as well just to make say whatever the biggest threat in that encounter make sure it's actually attacking you which is what you want to focus on because you've always got that high amount of armor class cure wounds is good for a little bit of extra healing the different types of smite like thunderous and smearing are also good for different types of damage encounters where say enemies may be resistant to certain 
types of damage, they're really good for those encounters for extra damage. Heroism and Bless, and you've definitely got the freedom to pick here, but it's really up to you. But for the most part, it is dependent on like the subclass that you go for. But being that we're focusing on and like sort of ancients, like a good paladin here, those are the options that you'll go. But say if you're playing an Oathbreaker or a Vengeance or something, it's obviously a little bit more. At level four, you will gain a feat. Now, this is entirely dependent on how you want to build out your character. But in the full game, there is a lot of really, really good heavy armor. So going the heavy armor master to increase your strength by one, but also so incoming damage from non-magical attacks also decrease by three when you're wearing heavy armor. So it reduces the amount of damage you take is actually really valuable. Like there are plenty of great heavy armor options in the main game that you can go and grab. At level five, you'll get a, another attack. So when you do make an attack, you'll also be able to gain an additional attack every single turn. And then at level eight, you gain another feat, which you can grab here. I like Sentinel for this sort of sword and board paladin. So essentially what that means is when an enemy within melee range attacks an ally, you can use a reaction to attack them or some various other effects as well. You can advantage on your opportunity attacks. So gives you options to sort of attack for free, which is really beneficial when you are in melee range a lot and sort of playing that protector role, which we're talking about for the paladin here. A couple of quick tips for the paladin. Tick all of the reaction options when you do bring up your reactions. So rather than them just triggering on their own, you can actually see what's triggering and save your reactions for certain types of things that you want in combat, especially the one to add divine smite to critical hits. Definitely tick this because you absolutely want to do that every time that comes up because of the amount of damage it does do. You can also dual wield hand crossbows in your offhand like weapon slot. So you can use a crossbow as a bonus action if you don't have something else you want to use for that bonus action for that turn. And paladins excel at fighting undead, fey, and fiends. And there are tons of them in Baldur's Gate 3. Make sure you're right clicking and then examining enemies to see what they actually are. So if you're using, say, Divine Smite on the right targets that are undead, you get that extra radiant damage. And there is a huge benefit to fighting those targets. And there is, there's a lot of them in Baldur's Gate 3. So just make sure you're checking that out how to play the rogue. Now, these are the most stealth-based class of any of the classes. They also gain benefits from having great mobility because they can cast cunning actions. So as a bonus action, rather than an action, you can dash, hide, or engage. Plus, they have the sneak attacks for melee and range, which give you an additional 1d6 of damage to any sneak attack, and sneak attacks always have advantage as well, so you're practically guaranteed to hit there, plus you get that extra damage. Astarian, the companion, is also a rogue, so if you're interested in how to build him out then this video will help you with that as well so the best race options for the rogue is really you know you can pick anything for the role playing purposes but if you're planning to play a melee focused road say maybe dual wielding some daggers or something i would pay attention to the racial movement speed so something like elf tiefling drow human gith half elf dragonborn or half orc all have the standard movement speed of nine meters compared to the shorter races which have a shorter movement speed which obviously means they can't go as far and if you're trying to get into melee range and that can sometimes be like a little bit of a hindrance but you've obviously with the rogue you've got these cunning actions that you can cast so you can still dash and then still attack in that same turn as a ranged rogue i would highly recommend something that has dark vision and especially something like an elf that also gives you longbow proficiency so all rogues will have shortbow and crossbow proficiencies because they're simple weapons but an elf will also get longbows and there's some great longbow options in the game so it gives you more flexibility for those range options and dark vision so you can actually see in the dark because there are plenty of places in the game that are dark and you can even go say like a drow which has superior dark vision as well so that dark vision distance is actually doubled which means it makes it so much easier to hit enemies when you are in that sort of medium to long range and in those dark areas so you'll have a higher chance of actually hitting the best skills for the rogue are the dexterity based skills so you've got acrobats sleight of hand for all the lock picking and stealth and especially stealth i highly recommend that you not only stay proficient in stealth but actually pick it as one of your expertise so as a rogue you can gain expertise in two skills which will double your proficiency bonus i would recommend to grab sleight of hand for this so you've got extra proficiency for lock picking as well as stealth so you can trigger stealth in combat even when enemies are looking at you you can actually pass a stealth check to actually get off your sneak attacks as long as you're not in like melee range it's actually really powerful your background is more role-playing sort of choices but in terms of the dexterity based skills here you've got the charlatan the criminal and the urchin but you can honestly pick whatever you 
you like. For ability points, you do want to focus on dexterity as your primary. Constitution is also important for the hit points, but less so. But the one thing I will call out here is that if you are going to play an arcane trickster subclass, then intelligence is important as that is your spellcasting modifier, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. The leveling up process for the rogue is pretty similar regardless of the subclass choice you pick in that you always gain the cunning actions and some of the other class benefits that you do get. It's just that at level three, you will pick a subclass. Now, the differences between the subclasses here is thief, arcane trickster, and assassin. As a thief, you'll gain fast hands to give you an additional bonus action as well as second story work so you can fall without taking damage. The arcane trickster is like the mage focus subclass so you'll gain access to some spells as well as the mage hand cantrip which is not good slash broken at the moment in the game. So as this subclass the mage hand when you cast it is supposed to be a spectral hand which is invisible and it can carry out additional tasks. Those additional tasks don't actually work in the game right now and I don't know exactly what that's supposed to be like typically you know it could be like lock picking that sort of a thing but you can't really do anything like that with the mage hand and the mage hand can only be cast once per short rest which makes it much more less effective and it only lasts 10 turns which actually isn't a very long time when you're just like playing the game in real time like it'll just disappear randomly after you've barely done anything with it so the arcane trickster as a whole probably isn't in a good spot right now maybe if they fix the mage hand it might be a little bit better but the last subclass is the assassin subclass and this specializes in attacking from stealth out of combat so you gain advantage on attack rolls against creatures that haven't had their turn yet if you successfully trigger an ambush on a surprise creature it's always a critical hit and if you start combat from this position as well you'll also regain your action and bonus action at the start of combat i originally started astarian as sort of my rogue setup as an assassin but i ended up switching back to thief because while the benefits to the assassin and being able to trigger combat from that stealth position and gaining all of those benefits is definitely a positive the bonus action that you gain from the thief is just significantly better because of the cunning action to hide you can essentially hide every turn and then use your sneak attack in combat but then you can also then dash if you wanted to move around you could attack with an offhand weapon you could stealth again so you can't actually get attacked because you know enemies can't see you but that bonus action that you get from thief is just so powerful that you can't really go wrong with it especially with the issues with the arcane trickster and then just the assassin not being as flexible as the thief can be but i have chosen to bring astari into sort of a ranged stealth option with the thief and sort of focusing on stealthing in combat and then using those ranged attacks and then potentially doing some melee if i need to because i'm dual wielding weapons so i can do some offhand attacks and that's sort of the direction i've taken astari and it's been really really successful Continuing the level up process, at level 4 you'll pick your first feat and depending on whether you're going melee or ranged then you've got a couple of options here. If you're going ranged, sharpshooter is a huge benefit here. So your ranged weapon attacks do not receive penalties for high ground rules and ranged weapon attacks with weapons you are proficient in have a minus 5 penalty to their attack roll but deal an additional 10 damage. Now if you are attacking from stealth you already have advantage on that attack roll plus obviously the extra damage you get from stealth. So if you trigger this all in effect as well well, you are practically still guaranteed to hit that shot, especially if you're hitting it from high ground. So you just get an extra 10 damage for free without having to do anything else. So it's a massive buff to range damage. Now, you won't really make a lot of choices as a rogue when you do level up. You'll just get a lot of class features for just leveling up and increasing your HP. But at level 8, you will pick a another feat. Now, I would go either something like lightly armored or ability improvement here to get your dexterity up to 18 depending on what your actual stats are but just trying to get that to the next positive number is probably the important thing there but athlete is another good option for that so you get that extra dexterity as well but for a melee rogue you've got mobiles to increase your movement speed as well as avoiding some opportunity attacks is definitely a positive for a sort of melee focused rogue and then again at level eight when you pick your but for your second feed it's still the same you want to get that additional benefits to your dexterity and try and hit it into that next big bracket some tips for playing the rogue sneak attack is so strong and it is the critical part of the rogues kit and you should be using it as often as possible whether that is to start combat or even in combat by using your cunning action to hide and then triggering the stealth attack something that you can do outside of combat is just have your rogue in stealth all the time and they'll just sort of lag behind the party so if the party gets like like surprised then the rogue actually won't be in combat it just because it'll be lagging behind because it's walking slower because of stealth so you'll have that time to be able to line them up to wherever you want to attack from and then also the same as like conversation 
decisions. If you're in a conversation that you think may break out in combat, you can character select your other characters, put them in hiding, set them up before you actually trigger the combat encounter. If you do have a bonus action left over at the end of your turn, you can use it to hide again so that enemies won't attack you, so you can avoid damage coming towards them. And occasionally, sometimes enemies will actually like use their turn to try and find a Starion or whatever your rogue is. I've noticed that happen a couple of times. So they waste their turn just like running around trying to find where the rogue went. Speaking of the rogue, Astarian, if you aren't going the arcane trickster subclass, I definitely recommend going to Withers and respecking him. Stay as like the class the rogue, but you want to change his ability points because it will allow you to hear because there's a lot of wasted ability points for Astarian if you're not going an arcane trickster because he has a high amount of intelligence, which makes sense from like a role playing perspective, but from a min max perspective, it doesn't make sense when you can put those points into dexterity or constitution or something and actually give him benefits from that intelligence which you're not getting unless you're going the arcane trickster because as an arcane trickster intelligence is your spell casting modifier also make sure that any weapons that you're using like melee weapons have the finesse trait so that they are able to scale with dexterity rather than strength and dual wielding is super important for a rogue so you can use your offhand attack as a bonus action so you can get multiple attacks off as you don't gain an extra attack like some of the other sort of melee focus classes do that's the way you can get extra attacks off So the wizard is an interesting class. Now you could basically categorize it as a bit of a glass cannon. They have a very large spell pool, which gives them a lot of flexibility in terms of any sort of a combat encounter to deal different types of elemental damage. So if enemies are resistant to one type, you can then modify the spells you're using to use different types. You can also have access to plenty of different spells that can manipulate enemies, say, you know, have them on the ground laying laughter, like Tasha's hideous laughter or other ways to put them to sleep or something like that. If you've got plenty of flexibility as a wizard but the downside here is that you have no armor proficiency or really any relevant or good weapon proficiency and you also have a very low health pool so you'll definitely be wanting to avoid damage by various methods which we'll talk about in this video but you'll have access to a huge amount of spells because you can learn spells just from scrolls to really gain sort of benefits from the flexibility of the kit now you will also have arcane recovery so once per day out of combat you can replenish expended spell slots which is obviously important so you can cast more spells. But let's make a wizard. So we'll start with the best races. Now, obviously you can just role play here as you see fit, but as a wizard, movement speed doesn't really matter. So playing a taller or a shorter character doesn't matter that much. Neither does dark vision because we'll mostly be using spells. So you can really sort of grab anything here that you want to. Like you could go something that maybe has a proficiency in something you might like, say like a human or a half elf. If you say you wanted to equip a shield for some extra armor class to avoid a little bit more damage or Maybe you want to go like an elf so you can equip a longbow or a short bow just in case you run out of spell slots. I also really like halfling for a wizard so you get the lucky racial effect so when you roll a one on an attack roll, ability check or saving throw, you can re-roll that dice so it'll prevent you from rolling ones a couple of times. But yeah, really you can go anything as a wizard. There's not too much sort of restriction there. In terms of the best skills for the wizard, you definitely want to be leaning into the intelligence skills here. So arcana, history, investigation, nature and religion and the same goes for backgrounds which are a little bit more role play, but you know, you could go Acolyte, Noble or Sage, which all have intelligent skills. So you don't have to worry about picking them in terms of your skill slots. For your ability points, you want to focus on intelligence, dexterity and constitution. You want to max out your intelligence as close as you can to 17 and then con and dex, you probably want to get to 14 if you can because of that positive number benefits you get from having that. And then you can sort of spread out any other relevant ability points as you sort of see fit. Now we'll cover cantrips and spells in a little bit because we're going to sort of cover them all together rather than the ones to worry about just in character creation. The next major decision comes at level two, which is picking a subclass. Now you may notice that all spells have listed what type of spell they are, whether they're evocation, necromancy, illusion, transmutation, etc. And there is a matching school for all of these for the wizard. So specializing in one of these schools will halve the cost of actually learning a spell from that school from a scroll. So wizards can learn spells from scrolls. So if you say specialize in something like evocation and you've got an evocation scroll, the cost of learning that spell off the scroll will be cheaper, but you'll also gain different class or subclass benefits from those. Now, it's really up to you and what you want to sort of use here. My recommendation, if you're building out sort of a damaged, focused, 
wizard, which is what I'm sort of talking about here with Gale, is probably either to go Aberration, Evocation, or Necromancy. But Invocation is definitely the stronger one for some of the AoE spells. So because you get Sculpt spells, you can create pockets of safety within your Evocation spells. So allies will automatically succeed saving throws against spells and take no damage. So a great example of this is something like Fireball, which is a huge spell that does a heap of damage. And it's absolutely an essential spell for a wizard. You can then just throw it on your, say, melee characters who are probably surrounded by enemies and it doesn't matter because they won't take damage from that so you'll get benefits definitely from using that and evocation is really powerful because of that but you could go something like the necromancer for grim harbors so once per turn if you kill a creature with a spell you regain hit points equal to twice the spell slot level used so if you say struggle with survivability which wizards absolutely do then it can help you survive a little bit better but there are other ways to avoid that which we'll talk about in a bit as well but you've really got the option here and you could always just respec if you say wanted to change the subclass that you're focusing on. But for the most part, wizards will always learn the same spells. It's just what you want to specialize in. Leveling up as a wizard is pretty straightforward as you'll just learn more spells and spell slots that you can sort of pick from, but every four levels you will gain a feat. Now as a wizard, it's interesting to see what you can pick here. There's nothing that I would say is absolutely critical. It's a little bit dependent on your flavor. The mage initiates for all of the different mage classes can give you some interesting cantrips. Say, for example, if you wanted to learn Eldritch Blast from the Warlock School or something like Ritual Casting, which will allow you to learn some different spells like Speak to Animals or Find Familiar so you could summon creatures. Spell Sniper is good as well. So you can learn a cantrip and the number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking is reduced by one. So if you roll a 19 or a 20, then it will technically be a critical hit and you can learn Eldritch Blast from that or say Thorn Whip or something as well. But something that I would sort of probably suggest mostly, it would be Elemental Adept. So you can pick a category here and your spells ignore resistance to that damage type of your choice. And when you cast spells of that type, you can't roll a one. I would do this and pick Fire for all of the really good fire spells. Not only do you have Firebolt as a cantrip, you've got Fireball, which is a massive AOE damage. You've got Wall of Fire, which deals good damage as well. So ignoring those resistances is a really good benefit just to the overall damage because a lot of enemies enemies have resistance to a lot of different element types and fire seems to be a very common one so it's a good one to avoid bit plus with all the good fire spells definitely gives you benefits from that now when you pick your next feat at level eight it's again sort of up to you like we've already talked about those other choices but the one we haven't touched on is ability improvement which you could definitely pick up so you can get your intelligence to 18 being that next even number so you can add that extra damage and rolling to your saving throws and spell casting modifiers so you could definitely do that and obviously pick any of the other options that I mentioned or something else, you know, if you, if you want to. Spells and cantrips. They are the core part of the wizard kit. Now we already touched on how you can learn spells via scrolls, which you can definitely do, but we're going to go through some sort of good options here. But because as a wizard, you can prepare your own spells at any time, you can essentially decide what you like and dislike. And that's sort of up to you, but we'll just cover off some good ones here. For cantrips, some good range damage options like Firebolt, Acid Splash, and Ray of Frost are really good options to run, especially Firebolt and Ray of Frost. Mage Hand kind of sucks right now. I talked about that in my Rogue video that it only lasts a certain period of time. It can only be used every short second short rest. It's not as good as it used to be in the early access. Dancing Light also has its moments. Say if you want to help out some ranged allies that don't have dark vision. For spells, the main one that is an absolute must is Mage Armor. So you can increase your armor class by three. So you will definitely avoid more damage as a wizard, which is highly advisable. Magic Missile is amazing. It does force damage and it also so it always hits and as you level this up like it will just level with you so you can use like level three level four spell slots of magic missile deal more damage be able to use more missiles it's absolutely a well worth spell to get and something like ray of sickness or ice knife are both good ranged options as well thunder wave is a good option to sort of push enemies away from you but once you get level two spells and sort of beyond you'll be able to get misty step and you can sort of drop thunder wave so you can misty step away from enemies as a bonus action i definitely use this heaps chromatic orb is amazing because you can tailor the damage type to the enemy's resistances. So if you right click and examine them and be like, oh, okay, you're resistant to, let's say fire damage, then I could use chromatic orb as say lightning damage or something like that. So you can be aware of those resistances and sort of modify the damage type dependent. Sleep and Tasha's hideous laughter and those sort of spells that can stun or, you know, like lock enemies from taking their turns can also be valuable. I like Tasha's hideous laughter a little bit more than sleep because sleep is dependent on the amount of hit points that the target has. Whereas Tasha's hideous laughter 
is a saving throw. And then there's the fire spells like Fireball and Scorching Ray, which we obviously touched on a little bit earlier, which you'll need if you are picking up the Elemental Adapt for Fire, like we talked about. The last thing that I'll say for spells is Counter Spell is incredible. So grab this as soon as it becomes available to you at level three when you're looking at your level three spell slots. Now, essentially what this does is it gives you a reaction as a wizard, which you typically won't use in any sort of other way. And anytime someone casts a spell within your radius, you will then get the option to react to that and counter that spell. This is huge in a number of scenarios where you're fighting other wizards that have unique spells, especially in some combat scenarios that they will be using spells that aren't typically available in the main pool. Like maybe they're specific to like that sort of, you know, boss encounter enemy type, and you can then counter spell that. You will use a spell slot for using that, but saving your level three, level four, etc., spell slots for counter spells can often be really critical in certain encounters that you have enemies that just deal like really critical spells that change the way the fight flows. It's highly recommended. Recommended. A couple of other little class tips. You can do a little cheeky saves coming before you initiate combat because with the wizard, you can just prepare your spells as you sort of see fit, right? So if you know a fight's going to happen, you can start that fight, check what the resistances are, check what sort of the setup is, and then just reload that save and change your prepared spells. Misty step is absolutely huge to avoid damage. You should be misty stepping at any time that anyone comes near you to avoid damage and get away from them. Also get to high ground. The bark skin potion that you can craft in the alchemy screen can also give you 16 armor class rather than having to use mage armor if you don't want to waste a spell slot this is beneficial in the early game when spell slots are a little bit more limited but as you get further in the game it's not so much of a big deal and as a wizard because you're casting a lot of elemental spells pay attention to the elemental effects on the ground say for example if you cast the grease spell you can then light that grease with fire to create an explosion to deal damage and you can then put out that fire with something like ray of frost to clear that fire out of the way so pay attention to those different spells and the way they interact on the ground and the different things there's also barrels you can blow up and all sorts of stuff but So starting out with the Warlock. Now, this is sort of a different type of caster to say the traditional wizard or sorcerer in that you are a little bit more of like a battle mage archetype if that's the direction you wanted to go, but you also do have light armor and simple weapon proficiency, whereas most of the other casters don't have any armor or weapon proficiencies. So you've got a little bit of flexibility there and also your primary spell casting modifier is charisma. So you're actually a really good talker in conversations to pass some of those ability checks. One key difference for the Warlock cast as well is that you have warlock spell slots now these are different to normal spell slots in that one you'll have significantly less of them but they actually refresh on a short rest rather than a long rest so in a single combat encounter this means you can cast less like spells in total but over at the period of the, using those short rests, you actually get some of those spells back. So each encounter, you can still have some new spell slots that you can actually use. So let's start with the best race for the Warlock. Now, obviously, role-playing elements is obviously up to you, so you can pick whoever you like. But in terms of the Warlocks, because of their low amount of proficiencies, especially if you want to play it like a sort of a battle mage type, then consider something like, say, a human, a Githyanki, half-elf, or elf because they have those extra proficiencies like weapon proficiencies. So say if you wanted to use like a longsword or something, then an elf would fit that because it gives you that proficiency. Dark vision isn't as important as a warlock because you can actually get it as one of your eldritch evocations when you're leveling up. Though, if you aren't going to do that, then definitely consider picking a class that has dark vision. And it's very similar with movement speed, right? Because you can learn Misty Step. You can just like teleport around the battlefield. So movement speed isn't as important, but warlock doesn't matter too much. Maybe pick one based on a proficiency if you want to use something else or just pick it based on looks that's up to you the best skills are very easy to think about for the warlock because they have that charisma skills so deception intimidation performance and persuasion because charisma is our main modifier for backgrounds guild artisan entertainer noble or soldier are probably the best though it doesn't matter too much because you know you're going to have a really high charisma anyway so you can sort of use your background to get some other proficiencies if you choose for ability points charisma as we've already discussed should be on 17 and then you probably want to get your dexterity and constitution to 14 if possible because dexterity for that extra armor class because we won't be wearing a lot of heavy armor and constitution for a little bit of extra health as you probably take a bit more damage as a warlock than some of the other casters because you can get into that melee range and use some of that sort of weapon proficiencies that you do have. At character creation, you'll also pick a subclass between the Fiend, the Great Old One, and the Arch Fey. At a very high level, these are eerily similar except one major like subclass focus difference which we're going to talk about. So consider which one of these is more important to you. So for the Fiend, you will be 
be able to heal automatically when you defeat an enemy via the Dark One's Blessing. So when you reduce a hostile creature's hit points to zero, your Patreon will give you a certain amount of hit points based on your Charisma modifier. As a great old one, when you critically hit against a creature, that creature and nearby enemies are frightened until the end of the turn. And as an Arch Fae, you get Fae Presence, which allows you to charm or frighten creatures until the end of your next turn. Personally, I would suggest either Fiend or Great Old One because their effects actually just like initiate as sort of like a passive just based on actions that you do do. The Fiend is probably the stronger one if you're looking for some sort of extra survivability in that sort of battle mage archetype. But say if you just want to sort of sit back and relax in sort of, you know, ranged position, then the Great Old One for that frightening when you do critical hit is also valuable to have. As a Warlock, when you're leveling up, you will make some important decisions. And the first one that you'll make, and you'll actually continue to make it as you level up multiple different times as different invocations unlock is the Eldridge invocations. So initially you'll only have a limited amount of these options, but then the further levels you get, the more you'll get, there'll be more options at level five, seven, nine, and 12. Now, as you're picking the options here, the first one you should absolutely pick is Agonizing Blast. And what this will do is your Eldridge Blast will get empowered by adding your Charisma modifier to that. So every time you cast Eldridge Blast, you will add your Charisma modifier to its damage, essentially just increasing its damage. So the further you get up your Charisma modifier, the even more damage that Eldritch Blast will do, not only just including the fact that it levels up as a cantrip. Repelling Blast is again in this same category in that it will empower your Eldritch Blast to knock enemies away. You can actually use this in some scenarios to like knock enemies off things and like kill them by them actually taking that falling damage or say if they're up on like the rafters or something, you want to knock them down. It's definitely valuable for that. Now, we already touched a little bit on it, but Devil's Sight is an option to grab if you don't have Dark Vision natively as your class. It will allow you to see in the dark, which is useful for casting and things like that. And as you sort of get up the levels, it's it's really dependent on what makes sense to you and sort of what is interesting to you, though I would recommend to grab the Book of Ancient Secrets as it will allow you to cast Ray of Sickness, Chromatic Orb, and Silence without consuming a spell slot when you cast. So it gives you more options as a caster so you don't have to waste those two Warlock spell slots on these spells. And Chromatic Orb is great because you can deal multiple different types of damage with this spell, so you can sort of adjust depending on the enemy's resistances. The next thing you'll pick is a Pact of the Boon. Now, there's the Pact of the Chain, the Pact of the Blade, and the Pact of the Tomb. Each one of these will give you a different benefit. The Chain will give you a service of a familiar, so you can summon a Fae Spirit to help you either in combat or out of combat. The Blade is more of that Battle Mage focus, so you can either summon a Pact weapon or you can bind your existing weapon, which will add your spell casting ability modifier to that weapon's overall damage, so in this case, Charisma instead of Strength or Dexterity. And when you deepen your connection as this, you'll also gain an extra attack. So if you want to actually attack in melee range often with your Warlock, this is definitely the option you want to go. And then the last one is Tomb. Your patron grains a grimoire called the Book of Shadows, which allows you to cast Guidance, Vicious Mockery, and Thorn Whip. I personally think that you should go Tomb if you're looking for that Mage route. If you want to go the Battle Mage, then the Blade. But the Tomb route is really good because of Guidance. Now, if your Warlock is going to be your main Talker, even if it's not, right, and you have a Warlock in your party, Guidance allows you to have a higher chance of passing those skill checks because you can add Guidance to those skill checks, right? Like, it'll pop up and you can add that extra 1d4, so you've got a higher chance of passing it. But you've got the freedom here to pick what you like. Now, the last decisions you'll make in the level up process is your feats and I think you should grab defensive duelist if you're using a finesse weapon which if you're playing as either will or in the most case for the most part you probably will be using a finesse weapon as a warlock now what this will do is you'll allow you to use your reaction to add your proficiency bonus to your armor class and hopefully this will cause enemies to miss make sure in your reactions you turn on the option to ask because you can actually read what their attack roll is right let's say that their attack roll is 12 and your armor class is 10 and then if you pick this adding your proficiency bonus to two that will make it 12 meaning that they'll miss so you'll be able to tell exactly when they're going to hit or miss based on that pop up so you can choose whether to use your reaction or not so just make sure you're reading that but for the most part this is a good way to avoid damage as a warlock and then i would grab ability improvement to get your charisma to 18 or you could go performance say if you just wanted to use some instruments but that'll also get your charisma to 18 as well now the best spells and cantrips is super easy right just cast eldritch blast basically every combat turn like that's all you sort of need to 
know because its damage is so strong. It will also level with you, so as you level up, you'll be able to get an initial cast of it. It's a valuable spell, plus with the Charisma modifier, it's really, really good. I would also be using Hex regularly throughout your combat turns as a Warlock. So Hex is a bonus action spell, which will give disadvantage to a certain ability that you choose, which isn't the main reason you'll use it, but that can be valuable. The main reason is that anytime you attack that target, it will add necrotic damage. So if you are using, let's say, Eldritch Blast, and you've got two casts of Eldritch Blast hitting that same target, it will do 1d6 necrotic damage for both of those Eldritch Blast casts. So it just gives you a flat damage increase to the amount of damage you do. Misty Step is also super valuable as a Warlock, so you can teleport around as part of your spell slots. But otherwise, as a Warlock, because you've only got two spell slots, Hex is going to consume one of those. And if you Misty Step once in that encounter, it's going to use it as well. So you've already used up those slots. So otherwise, just think about how you're using those slots and whether you're going to just cast Eldritch Blast or do you even need to Misty Step. And we've already talked about like the Ray of Sickness, etc., that you get as part of your Eldritch Evocation, so you can cast in combat as well. A couple of quick tips for the Warlock. Now, Warlocks have that small spell slot pool, as we mentioned. After every encounter, you should be short resting as a Warlock just so you get those spell slots back. And they are great talkers, plus with guidance, you can pass almost any conversational check that you do need to if you want to be a talker. Really valuable for that. And the Warlock and Eldritch Knight are unique in that there are some weapons in the game that are only useful for them as they get additional bonuses if you do have a pact as a Warlock or you are an Eldritch Knight. So pay attention when you do see those weapons as they're really good to use if you can actually use them as sometimes they're more sort of lean towards the Eldritch Knight, but I just thought I'd call that out. So the fighter is one of the most consistent martial focus classes in the game in both ranged and melee options. Preferably for the most part, fighters will be a melee class wielding some sort of martial or simple weapons and dealing damage in melee range, though you do also have ranged weapon proficiencies. So you have a lot of flexibility in terms of how you want to deal with combat in that way. They also make a great tank class because of their armor proficiencies, their shield proficiencies, the high hit points, as well as second wind, which is a class mechanic that on their turn as a bonus action, they can regain some of their hit points as well. So lots of solid options as a fighter, but for the most part, you'll just be using your standard attacks plus the standard attacks of the various weapons that you may have equipped. So I guess one of the first tips for the fighter is that you won't necessarily be using spells unless you go a certain subclass, but the actual effects of the weapon in terms of the different attacks that they give you are much more important for a class like this because they can often be really critical to help you deal damage or AOE damage with cleave or something like that so just worth pointing out to pay attention to those like specific weapon attacks that you get for the weapons that you do use so let's cover the races real quick now obviously you can pick whatever you like for role playing racial movement speed is important for a melee focused fighter so something like or any of the taller races here and you could consider dark vision if you do want to play as a ranged focused fighter so make sure your class has dark vision but overall probably the best option a bit like the barbarian is probably the half orc because of relentless endurance so you can survive attacks if you are down as well as savage attacks which makes it so that your dice roll will be triple rather than double which is absolutely huge next you'll actually pick a fighting style and this is dependent on what you actually want to do as a fighter so you've got archery defense dueling great weapon fighting and protection here to sort of choose from as well as two weapon fighting now this is dependent on the type of weapon that you want to use if you're not sure at character creation just pick whichever one sounds most interesting to you and then you can actually respec your class and change this option later say for example if you end up like leaning towards Towards, let's say two weapon fighting and dual wielding compared to you may have actually chosen great weapon fighting instead you can actually make that change there skills aren't really the strength of a fighter so there isn't anything that's like critical to pick here you'll obviously grab athletics as it's the only strength kill but then you can maybe get something like acrobatics perception survival maybe and in terms of the background again you can sort of pick whatever you like here maybe soldier or noble probably would be the most consistent but that's entirely up to you for your ability points when you're choosing your list here getting your strength to 17 is the most important thing and then dexterity and constitution both on 14 dexterity for that initiative and armor class and constitution for those hit points are definitely critical to have make sure your charisma is on at least 10 as well if your fighter is going to be a talker like it does initially start at 8 so just make sure you bump that up it's also worth noting here if you're going to go the eldritch knight subclass that you will need intelligence as your spell casting modifier so so speaking of those subclasses you've got three to pick from at level three the first being battle master which will give you access to the superiority die which will allow you to make certain comments
combat attacks both melee and range depending on your choice here in the options that you do choose there's some really great options here for a martial focused class like being able to push enemies have them drop their weapon it sort of gives you it's not like a spell right because it is a martial attack but it gives you more flexibility in combat as a fighter if you don't want to go the spell route and allowing you to have these different effects on top of your attacks the eldritch knight will enhance your fighter with the study of magic so you'll essentially gain spells here to pick from as mentioned you will need intelligence for this as intelligence is the spell casting modifier so if you haven't specced into that make sure you do if you do go this route and the champion is a little bit more different like they hard lean into just like the normal attacks that you get with your weapons like melee and range a little bit more simple i would say than say the battle master or the eldritch knight definitely the eldritch knight if you're looking to what to, option to pick here personally i would say to go the battle master because you can stick to that sort of melee and range focus and the flexibility of the combat kit but you also get access to those superiority dice and the uniqueness of those different attacks being able to push enemies disarm them or do different effects at advantage at frightened all sorts of things and that gives you more flexibility in combat whereas the champion doesn't get that access but you still sort of focus on the melee or the ranged options whereas the eldritch knight changes the class and the play style much more significantly than the others when you're leveling up as a fighter you will get access to additional feats as a fighter so first you'll pick one at level four now here for the most part you probably want to go into the ability improvement to get your strength to 18 potentially get your dex or con higher if you're just trying to level out your stats properly getting your strength modifier to 18 for that extra number is very important for the extra feat here depending on what weapon you're using polearm master is probably a great option now there is heaps of really good glaives and halberds in the game for some reason i don't know why they get so many good weapons but there's heaps of them and the polearm master is a fantastic feat that allows you to get an opportunity attack if someone just enters your melee range but it also gives you the ability to make an extra attack as a bonus action when you are just attacking throughout your turn now if you're not using say like a polearm you can basically get these same benefits from great weapon fighting though it also comes with all in which we've talked about in the barbarian video so either of those are really good options say if you're two-handing some sort of a weapon or using a polearm though the polearms like weapon class is really good for the extra reach as well because they're much larger weapons it's a great option for your next feat i would probably go something like maybe savage attacker because you can then re-roll your damage dice to make sure it does more damage or you could even go something like the martial adept which will give you an additional superiority dice but it'll also allow you to pick more of those different options that say you maybe didn't pick as you're leveling up and sort of choosing the different actions that you can pick from so there's plenty of options there but definitely pick up savage attacker if you've got the extra space the ability improvement and then whatever your weapon class that you were using and choose that feat. Some general tips for the fighter. If you're picking Lazil, you may want to respec her just to make sure that her stats are right for like a min-max perspective, like her ability points, but that's entirely up to you. There isn't a huge amount to say about the fighter. Like they are a very consistent damage focused class you get that extra attack at level five so you'll definitely be attacking twice per turn plus potentially three times if you're thinking about using something like polar master or the great weapon fighter but for the most part there isn't heaps that you need to worry about like you definitely want to equip a bow so you can do some of that range damage especially in the battle master line because all of the maneuverability attacks that you get to use those security dice they come with both a melee and a ranged option because you get that freedom to choose between the two right so say if you can't get into close range because you just don't have enough movement speed you've got that ranged option for those encounters when you do have that make sure as well that you go into the menus and enable the ask option for all of the reactions because you will have a lot of reactions as a fighter especially if you've gone like polearm or even sentinel you'll get heaps of reactions but just make sure you're enabling that option because you don't want to like accidentally waste your reaction on something that maybe you didn't want to but it's also good just to know when those reactions go off like i always enable it on all my characters i feel like it's just for me personally i like to know when those reactions are happening rather than just them triggering on their own because in some cases the further you get down the line and you have different reactions that you can trigger you may want to skip reacting to something because you want to keep that reaction for something else to occur if that makes sense 
So playing as a cleric is definitely a support focus class. You've got access to a bunch of healing spells as well as other types of aid spells to either buff your allies or debuff enemies. And you've also got the occasional damage spell sort of along the way, especially dependent on your subclass, which we'll talk about briefly in a little bit. But there's some unique factors when you think about considering a cleric. They have a huge amount of subclasses, which give them a lot more flexibility than some of the other classes in terms of their overall play style and flexibility. But just generally, for the most part, the clerics are act similar to like, say, a paladin in terms of combat, because you will be using some sort of like melee attacks. Some turns you'll be dealing spells to heal, buff, debuff, some other turns, maybe occasionally you'll use like a damage spell, but there's definitely some flexibility in terms of the actual play style of the cleric. So let's break that down really. And we'll start with the races. Now, picking a race here, obviously role play considerations here, but depending on your subclass choice, you may want to consider picking a race that is going to add proficiencies because the cleric is sort of lacking in the proficiencies department. You've got light and medium armor, which is great. You've got shields, which is great, but you've only got simple weapons. So you're missing a bunch of weapons, especially one-handed weapons, if you wanted to stick with sort of a sword and board sort of general setup. So maybe consider something like the dwarf for the axes and hammers, the humans and half elves for spears, pikes, halberts, and glaives, gith or elf for the swords and the drow for the short swords and the rapiers, maybe your option. But obviously here you can just pick whatever you like for role-playing perspective. Now, speaking of those subclasses, this is the core part of like a cleric's kit and you've got tons of options here. The domain that you pick here will really focus on how you want to specialize your cleric. So we'll break these down at sort of a high level and go through each. First, the life domain is very paladin-like. You'll gain heavy armor proficiency as well as the discipline of life, which is a healing buff. And essentially, for the most part, your spells that you'll gain access to throughout this line are very healing or reviving allies orientated. And you'll be focused more on that general setup. The light domain gives warding flame to allow you to shield yourself with divine light so you can give your enemies disadvantage on their attacks you also gain access to say like light and fire based spells here so if you want to do more of say like a little bit more of a caster right like you wanted to use some fire spells or something like that then the light domain might be an option the knowledge domain doesn't gain much except additional skill proficiencies and skill expertise so for those skills that you are expertised in you'll double your proficiency bonus so if, say you really wanted to focus on that route and not failing any checks the nature is like a dru druidic subclass you get shillelagh which is an amazing cantrip by the way so you can enhance your melee weapon with bludgeoning damage if you're using that specific type of weapon that shillelagh uses you've also got tempest which gives you heavy armor and martial weapons as well as the wrath of storm which allows you to strike a target back if they attack you with thunder and they are more focused on that sort of thunder lightning damage sort of spell route trickery domain which is what shadow heart is is I guess you could similarly say it maybe is a little bit like a rogue inspired. You've got the blessing of the trickster giving another creature stealth checks. Plus you can charm people and disguise self. So you've got that going for you. The war domain is similar to the Tempest in that you gain heavy armor and martial weapons, but you also gain war priest. So when you use the attack action, you may make one more weapon attack as a bonus action in that same turn. So this is definitely a lot to break down. So how do you like make that decision? So at a very high level, do you want to be more healer focused then go the life domain? If you want to specialize in martial damage, actually damaging enemies, then the war or the tempest domain go that route. Maybe you want to be a hybrid caster with still doing some melee damage, the nature or the light domain. And then the trickery domain and the knowledge domain are just very specific into what their archetypes actually are. Next in character creation, you'll pick a deity, which is essentially what the god, the cleric worships for their power. This is really just a role-playing choice. It'll give you some additional dialogue options. So pick whichever one sounds more interesting to you. The best skills here is definitely the wisdom skills, so animal handling, insight, medicine, perception, and survival. Depending on your domain choice here, you'll either gain proficiencies or extra expertise in some of these skills. So you've got the freedom here to pick what you like. In terms of backgrounds, acolyte, folk hero, guild artisan, and survival are probably the best, but pick whichever one sounds most interesting to you. For your ability points, you want to make sure your wisdom is at 17 because that is your spell casting modifier. And then it depends on your focus. If you are going to focus on melee weapons, then get your strength to 14 and your dex 
to 12 and your con to 14. But maybe if you're going to be more of, say, a ranged spell caster, a bit more of the support route, then instead get your dex to 14 and your con to 14 because that extra dexterity will increase your armor class and your initiative, whereas you don't have to worry too much about dealing that melee damage, which you would rather do with your strength. While you're leveling up, regardless of your domain choice, you will gain access to a bunch of different spells which you'll be able to use. Sometimes you'll gain unique spells based on your domain, but for the most part, you'll just gain access to a bunch of spells that you can either prepare in your spell book or be able to use as you see fit. When you are picking your feats, the first one to go would be ability improvement to get your wisdom to 18. So you've got that as a modifier. So you get that extra point. And for your second feat at level eight, I would say it's dependent on what sort of a play style you've taken your cleric. If you're focusing on that melee route, depending on the weapon you're using, you could go something like polar master. So you can then attack as an extra bonus action and get an extra opportunity attack when enemies enter your range. You could go shield master if you're focusing on a bit more of that support aspect even something like sentinel sort of fits that bill as well you could specialize in whatever armor class you're specializing in the cleric has a lot of options but i don't think that there's anything like a specific 100 option that you need to worry about picking and you could also consider going the mage initiate for the druid if you wanted to pick up some of the druid spells because you will be able to do that like shillelagh say if we're talking about like the nature domain if you are going a different route but you still want to use shillelagh you could go and grab that as well let's quickly talk about spells and cantrips guidance as a cantrip is amazing so you should grab this as a cleric now what this allows you to do is add an extra 1d4 to any skill check that you do have so this is fantastic to help you pass skill checks especially some of those ones that happen in sort of the mid to late game that have ridiculous difficulty class sacred flame is your main damage dealing cantrip it's a dexterity saving throw which a lot of enemies have high dexterity so this will miss a lot so it's often better to attack in different ways than you sacred flame but if that's the only option to you then obviously do that command is a fantastic spell that you can command a creature to say run away or grovel on the ground or drop their weapon fantastic if they have a unique weapon that you essentially want for yourself healing word and like aid and mass healing word are just fantastic healing spells which i would definitely use healing word is better than cure wounds because healing word can be used from ranged but if say you aren't like focusing on that sort of ranged aspect of the kit then cure wounds isn't too bad if you've got say a melee character that you want to heal but i personally prefer healing word for that flexibility aid is also a great like healing spell because it will heal your allies but it also increases their hit point maximum so you should do this before fight start spirit guardians is fantastic damage for a melee focused cleric that you're trying to get nice and close in enemies and have them attack your cleric you just get free damage off by doing that so moving on to tips right as a cleric because you've got a lot of spell options and you can actually prepare your own spells you've got the freedom here to make the spell choices yourselves and change the spells you have active depending on the encounter that's in front of you so make sure you're checking your spell book for that and also you've got access to a bunch of concentration spells and some concentration spells that don't expire after 10 turns you could say cast them before fights actually start and then you've got that act effect active during that encounter without having to consume your action i also low-key think that maybe you should go to withers and respect shadow hearts subclass from trickery domain just you know this is a personal thing for me you can obviously not do that if you don't feel the need to but i personally don't believe the trickery domain is one of the best subclasses for combat aspects it obviously is part of her role playing but you can go and change it if you do like especially updating her ability points here because they aren't great in terms of their alignment and speaking of ability points for a cleric you need to be aware that you will be using strength as your main like attacking modifier when you're just using melee attacks unless you are holding a finesse weapon so say if you want to have a higher dexterity or say in shadowheart's case her dexterity is higher you're not actually gaining much benefit from using a melee weapon that doesn't have the finesse effect so essentially what finesse allows is it allows to add your dex modifier rather than your strength modifier if your dex is higher when you make a swing with that weapon so the monk, now this was the last class that was added to Baldur's Gate 3, and they're actually really unique because mainly because of their key mechanics. So monks have this like key point system, which is how you will use a lot of your unique mechanics within this class. And for the most part, that is using these unarmed attacks that can either make enemies prone or just give you like a flurry of blows or in one of the subclasses, you can actually use it to cast like a various amount of spells as well. So there's flexibility, but that key resource will be the key aspect of your kit didn't mean to pun there but it's sort of the main focus of the 
monk class. And typically you'll also have some sort of a quarter staff weapon, which you may use occasionally to generate yourself an extra bonus attack or just in general in combat. But for the most part, as a monk, dexterity will be your primary stat. They have unarmored defense similar to the barbarian, except it uses your wisdom modifier rather than constitution. So you won't be wearing armor typically. So you can add your constitution modifier to your armor class. So keep that in mind when you're picking your ability points, as well as the unarmored movements so when you're not wearing armor, you also have an increase to your overall movement speed. So there's a lot of interesting things about the monk that makes them a fun class to play and very unique compared to the other classes in the game. So let's break it down starting with the races. Now obviously roleplay considerations here but proficiencies don't really matter because you've already got simple weapon proficiencies for your quarter staffs which is the most part of like weapon usage that you'll use. You're not going to wear any armor because of unarmored movement and defense so armor proficiencies don't matter here. Dark vision doesn't really matter that much either because you probably won't be ranged really ever as a monk even in one of the subclasses that have some ranged spells so really you can sort of just pick whatever is like works for you like half orc is maybe like the min maxed option because of the endurance as well as savings attacks but for the most part there's a lot of freedom to who you want to play as a monk in terms of best skills i'd probably be focusing on the dexterity skills like stealth acrobats and sleight of hand though you will have a decent amount of wisdom if you are going the four elements spell casting subclass so the wisdom skills would honestly not be too bad but just take that into consideration and when looking at your ability points there's a couple of things to consider now we're going to talk about subclasses next so just keep that in mind but when you're deciding on what to pick for your ability points wisdom as your spell casting modifier you will need some wisdom if you're going the four elements say the ranged like options like in terms of its spells subclass so you might need some wisdom there wisdom is also important because it is your spell casting modifier as the four elements subclass or it's also in your unarmored defense for that wisdom modifier but it's less important unless you are going for elements but it's also just something to consider because it is added to your armor class but dexterity is definitely your primary but if you're not going that route you're just going to focus on the martial aspects of the monk then the dexterity strength is also important especially if we're going to pick up the tavern brawler feet but then obviously constitution for your health as well as adding your constitution modifier to your armor class so you definitely want to make sure you've got a solid amount of constitution but speaking of those subclasses at level three you'll pick between the way of the open hand the way of the shadow and the way of the four elements the way of the open hand specializes in that unarmed combat sort of enhancing your flurry of blows to add different effects to them say for example maybe making a target prone or stunning them or adding effects to your flurry of blows sort of attacks the way of the shadow is a stealth orientated subclass that gives you access to stealth focus like spells and cantrips like dark vision darkness pass without a trace those sort of things that allow you to essentially play like a ninja sort of a role the way of the four elements gives you access to some unique monk spells that are based around the four elements that you can then use in combat so you can use something like a water whip to like pull enemies towards you while dealing water damage or some sort of like fire hand attack there's like lots of different options in the four elements but they are essentially enhancing those martial aspects of the monk with some sort of elemental spells and that sort of a thing picking an option here is a little up to you obviously and i would either say to go the open hand to enhance your flurry of blows if you want to focus on those martial aspects or four elements as I really actually do like the spell sort of elements that come with the the four elements kits and the different spells you get access to either of those I would say is probably the most consistent whereas the way of shadow is a little bit harder to get that really good value out of because you got to focus on those ninja aspects the best feats here is definitely ability improvement as it often always is to increase your dexterity and your constitution primarily as we talked about earlier their importance and strength obviously isn't too bad to grab there if you've just got extra points to get into a positive number or even number and then you can't go wrong with tavern brawler either so when you make an unarmed attack or improvised weapon or throw something which we're mostly focused on the unarmed attack here your strength modifier is added twice to the damage and attack rolls so it'll definitely help you with a bit more consistency for the monk class and you can obviously use that extra ability point to strength or constitution whichever one gets you to an even number as well but, but let's talk about some general class tips and information about this class so the monk in general regardless of your subclass that you pick will be making a lot of attack actions every turn both as bonus actions and normal attacks whether you're attacking twice just in terms of your like extra attack or then using those extra attacks as bonus actions for unarmed attacks 
You've got a lot of freedom in combat to make a lot of actions and it really helps the monk to pressure say whatever the highest threat enemy target is because they can also stun or prone them or using some of the four elements they can add different effects as well you've got options there so typically in combat you want to send your monk to whatever like the highest threat target is and try and stun lock them with some of the open hand mechanics if you went into that subclass or using some of the four elements if you went into that round as well if you're going to go the four elements subclass think about grabbing the different effects that can manipulate enemies so an example of this would be something like the fist of the four thunders which can allow you to push enemies away from you say essentially like push them down holes or push them off cliffs that sort of a thing can also be valuable to use water whip can allow you to pull enemies towards you so you don't have to make that distance for your melee attacks or, or just knock them prone that's also effective that same thought process goes to like the open hand subclass as well because you can use your flurry of blows to topple enemies to knock them prone or stagger them with flurry of blows stagger so you, you want to be thinking about ways to essentially like stop the enemy from attacking or adding effects to them stunning strikes is another way of doing this which is another attack that you get part of your key points that you can use to consume if you've used all your key points in a combat encounter you can use wholeness of body as a class action which you can use to get half of your key points back as well as do some healing which is a great way to keep your monks sustained because of their lack of armor as well as potential healing elements to their overall kit as well similar to the rogue you also have bonus actions that you can cast like disengage dash and patient defense which is unique to the monk class but for the most part you'll use those bonus actions to actually make unarmed attacks if you have attacked in that same turn but the dash one could definitely come in handy so you can actually get into melee range to make your actual action attack in that turn but overall like you're just gonna punch things and make a lot of attack actions stun them prone them move them around and it's a really fun class because of that plus you've also got a high amount of movement speed because of your unarmed movement you can enhance your movement speed with different gear as well so you'll be able to get close to enemies to be able to attack them compared to some of the other like melee front lining sort of classes i wouldn't have a monk as your only frontline melee character because they can take a fair brunt of damage because they don't have the hugest amount of hit points they also only have unarmored defense defense is like their main way to increase their armor class so i would definitely have some sort of a alternative melee option whether that's a fighter like lazil or a paladin like on my main depends what that option is for you but just take that into consideration or even just ways to buff them right whether that be with shield of faith to increase their armor class or having a cleric or a bard sort of support them in that melee range but it's just something to consider that you definitely don't want them to take all of the damage in melee range as they can go down very quickly and lose a lot of their health because they don't have a lot of sustain like fire themselves and they need to get that option either by someone else taking those hits or just by having someone heal them during those encounters. So playing as a druid is a lot, then there's a lot to sort of think about really. Now at its basic form, they are a spellcaster that has the wild shape ability. Wild shaping essentially allows them to take the form of a beast and you can do this a couple of times before you need to short rest to be able to do it again. This comes in handy in a number of ways. You can use this in combat and every time you take the shape of an animal, you'll have your own health pool as well as your own armor class. And they also have their own abilities like the bear can roar to sort of taunt, the wolf can howl to give allies movement the owlbear has like a damaging jump that it can do there's plenty of different ways that the druid in combat and the wild shaping actually has its elements but you can also use it outside of combat you know you can do shape into a cat to get into tiny places you can burrow into a badger and use that to sort of dig your way into areas that maybe you shouldn't be in there's plenty of different ways that you can use the wild shape form but outside of that the druid is also a very proficient caster in that not only do you have your own unique spells as part of the druid kit but you also can just be a solid like ranged sort of caster format and then on top of that if you wanted to you can also be a necromancer so there's like <laughs> there's a lot to the druid but let's sort of cover everything i can in this video and i'll give you a pretty good breadth of sort of hopefully make you choose how you want to play your druid so we'll start with the races now obviously role playing considerations here but the druids have solid proficiencies on their own and even so it doesn't really matter too much because you don't need those proficiencies unless you're going to use some sort of a melee just shillelagh focused druid using that shillelagh cantrip but for the most part here you can consider the movement speed if you are using that you know dark vision is maybe important if you're staying in your human form honestly you could pick whatever here the, the wood elf's probably like maybe the best option because you get a little bit of extra movement speed you also get dark vision it's also kind of law accurate i guess in a way like just you know when i think of druids i think of wood elves but yeah really you can go anything in terms of races skills are all about wisdom for the druids so animal handling insight medicine perception and 
and survival and for your backgrounds acolyte folk hero outlander and guild artisan are the ones that also have wisdom skills but it's entirely up to you in terms of your background ability points here you really want to max out your wisdom as it's your spell casting modifier and then i'd probably be trying to get your dexterity and your constitution as high as possible constitution obviously for health and dexterity for your initiative and your armor class but they're the sort of the three that i would focus on now subclasses so at level two you'll pick one of the three subclasses the circle of the land leads into the mage aspects of the kit you get natural recovery so once per day out of combat you can replenish your spell slots sort of like a wizard and this is definitely just like the most sort of typical spellcaster class bit more of a defensive focus maybe if you wanted to lean into the support elements of the druids kit the circle of the moon leans into wild shape especially combat wild shape so you can now cast the action combat wild shape as a bonus action to assume the force of a beast while you're actually in combat rather than it being an action and you also get additional wild shape forms as a circle of the moon druid circle of the spores is a necromancy themed subclass where essentially you will be staying in your human form and casting spells but you also have access to a bunch of new things compared to some of the other subclasses so the main one here is halo of spores which is a reaction that deals necrotic damage and it's super rare in this game where you can actually just trigger your reaction in your turn so if you think about it this way right like every time you make a combat turn you have an action and a bonus action and here as well with halo of spores you can actually make your reaction as well so essentially you're taking three you know actions in your actual combat turn but also keeping in mind if you're using that reaction you can't use your reaction for other things but you know you've got plenty of things that are all based around that necromancy like being able to bring up undead and then have them spawn their own undead and it's all based around that as well as the symbiotic entity which will grant temporary hp as well as bonus necrotic damage while it's active it's a very interesting subclass that's very unique if you wanted to play some sort of like play style a little bit different in the druid sort of setup so how do you pick between these three at a high level the land is probably a support defensive focused druid the moon is definitely a wild shape combat focused druid you'll definitely be in a some sort of a animal form during combat and the spores is definitely an offensive caster with those like necrotic abilities that you also can sort of tap into feats are a little weak for the druid because the druid's a weird class because you are sort of in a weird like hybrid between different archetypes so generally as a druid probably for most of your feats you probably just take the ability improve because when you're in like an animal form you can't really you know you're not using a weapon or any sort of other feats but you will keep your ability points so increasing those whether that be for your constitution or dexterity or something like that is definitely valuable to have especially your wisdom as well for casting you can also do maybe like say if you want to be more of a caster focus you could get something like the elemental adept and focus on say cold damage as elemental adept will remove enemies resistances it'll but yeah drew doesn't have anything that i would say is a must grab in terms of feats ability improvement and in getting your ability improvement possibly to get your wisdom to 20 or increasing your dex or constitution is definitely the route that i would go for the best spells and cantrips shillelagh we touched on a little bit earlier but essentially this allows you to imbue your melee weapon to use your spell casting modifier so wisdom with some extra damage plus bludgeoning damage it's a great cantrip to use if you're using some sort of melee damage with your druid moonbeam is a fantastic spell that allows you to, to like control an area a bit like cloud of daggers in that you'll place that down enemies in that area will take damage but also you can move it as a bonus action. So if the enemies move out of the way of it, you can actually move it back. You've also got all your healing spells like healing word and that sort of thing as a druid. Heat metal is great because so many enemies have metal weapons and you can heat that up. Not only will that damage them, in a lot of cases, they'll actually drop that weapon as well. So you've got options there and plus all of the typical damage spells like your ice storms and that sort of thing. Plus, if you're going the spore druid, then you've also got those necrotic spells and the reactions that you get access to like symbolic entity and halo of spores that you can use as well. So plenty of flexibility for the druids kit and you do have a lot of spell slots regardless of your subclass so you can definitely change between them and you know it, it change your spells that you have active as well because you know you do have access to that spell book some tips for playing the druids now these guys are they're not really your primary damage dealers they're not really your primary healers in some cases they're also not really your tanks in some cases because they can kind of do everything which makes them one of the funnest classes in the game because you can adapt to those scenarios that you need so in some fights maybe you even though you're not a moon 
injury, maybe you actually need a bit more melee damage or you need some sort of a frontliner, you know, you can shape into a bear. And by the way, you can do this before combat actually starts. So you don't have to waste that action, even as a moon druid, right? Obviously you get the bonus action to wild shape and combat wild shape, but you can do this at any time as long as you're not in combat. And obviously you can do it in combat as well. Now, there are the other forms, like as mentioned, how the badger can burrow underground or the cat can, you know, be a little stealthy and also distract enemies and sneak into little holes. And the raven can also fly. So make sure you're playing around with these different forms and seeing different ways you can interact with the sandbox in Baldur's Gate 3, because that's one of the best parts about the Druid's kit is these things that you can also do. When you are wild shaped as well, they also have their own health pool, which is an extension of your own. So once the wild shaped animal is defeated, you'll just switch back to your human form. So don't worry like too much about that. Say if you know you get defeated in your bear form or whatever, you'll get just going to switch back to your human form. But obviously if your human form gets defeated, then maybe that's an issue that should, you know, worry you. But for the most part, you don't have to worry too much about that. You can just shift back, say, via your bonus action if you're a moon druid or something like that. But you've also got access to all those spells. So just keep that in mind. So playing as a bard, you have a whole lot of things available to you, like I sort of touched on in the intro. So not only are you a versatile caster in that you gain a ton of spell slots and a pretty decent like breadth of different spells that you can use, both offensive and defensive and support spells, you also have a really high charisma as that's your spell casting modifier. So they are great talkers in combat. Say if you're playing a bard as your player character, you're talking a lot, you can pass a lot of charisma checks and there are heaps of charisma checks in this game. But even outside of that they also gain access to jack of all trades which allows them to add half their proficiency bonus to any ability check in the game that they're not proficient with and on top of that they also gain more skills than basically any other class in the game and they gain expertise in some skills which allows them to double their proficiency bonus in certain skills so you've got a bunch of spells and skills available to you and then also depending on your subclass choice you can either specialize in say like a paladin-esque sort of subclass using say a sword and a shield or something like that or you can go sort of a bit more of a flexible melee fighter range with like a some sort of a finesse weapon in one hand or you could just play as a spellcaster from range like the law subclass there's a lot of flexibility with the bard and i think that they are a really solid class if you're not exactly sure what you want to do in Baldur's gate 3 like if you just know that you want to pass a lot of checks like you don't like to see that dice roll saying it failed and you actually just sort of want to succeed in different ways then you're going to have a bunch of success with the bard so let's create a bard now we're going to start with the best races now obviously role play considerations here you can pick whatever you like but considering in terms of like a min max perspective you almost need to think about what subclass you're going as a bard because they are relevant when it comes to the proficiencies that you gain from your races so if you're going to say maybe play something like a college of law bard which doesn't gain medium armor proficiency or something then maybe the gith is helpful for that also the giths gain misty step as a racial spell as well so you can then use misty step without actually having to consume one of your spells that you are actually learning because you do have a limited amount of spells as a bard as an elf you get bow proficiency which is maybe a good backup if say you're looking to be some sort of a ranged caster and you run out of spell slots you can use a bow plus it also comes with dark vision if you're going the more melee route like the school of valor or school of swords the half orc is always a great option for melee classes because of the relentless endurance and savage attacks but you also won't have to worry about say going a gith for those races because you get medium armor proficiency just via that subclass so you're sort of doubling up a little bit there but you can maybe think about something like a half elf or a human or a dwarf for just different proficiencies as well but you've there's a lot of flexibility in terms of picking a race for the bard it just depends on what you're necessarily looking for but if you just want to pick based on role playing choices you really won't go wrong best skills for the bard now the charisma skills here are definitely the main ones so deception intimidation performance and persuasion you want to make sure you specialize in these for your background i would actually pick something that gives you dexterity based skills because as a bard you will have good dexterity so you could go something like charlatan criminal entertainer or urchin to gain some of those dexterity skills but also keep in mind that if you're going to go the school of or subclass you'll gain arcana intimidation and sleight of hand proficiencies so don't actually pick those up in character creation and on top of that you also gain jack of all trades at level two which we talked about earlier to add half of your proficiency bonus to any ability check you're not proficient in and later on you'll get some expertises as well so you can specialize even further in some of the 
charisma skills. But skills are very important for a bard and you're going to have a lot of them and you're going to pass a huge amount of them. For your ability points here, you want to get your charisma to 16 and get your dex to 16 or 15 and then your constitution to 14 as well. You could get your constitution up a little bit further if say you're going like the school of valor for like that sort of tanky subclass. You can maybe switch your dex and con around here to get that little bit of extra HP. It's also good for constitution saving throws if you're concentrating on something as well. But getting around that sort of mark for those stats is probably the main thing I would focus on. All right, so subclasses. Now there is three of them for the bard. There is the school of law, the school of valor and the school of swords. Each of these will change your bardic inspiration to sort of specialize in something specific. So bardic inspiration, which I think we forgot to touch on earlier. So that's my bad. But essentially what bardic inspiration does is it will allow you to add a 1d6 or as you get higher levels, that dice actually increases to a ally's next attack roll, ability check or saving throw. Now, depending on the subclass you pick here, your bardic inspiration will change in different ways and you'll use it in potentially different ways. But for the most part, the subclass that you pick at level three, you sort of know everything you need to know about what's going to happen with that line. So as a school of law, you're focusing on the spell casting elements of the bard. Now you'll gain proficiencies in arcana, intimidation, and sleight of hand. You also get the cunning words reaction. So you can give a target a 1d6 penalty to their next attack roll or ability checks or damage dealt, which is also a valuable way to use your reactions. You also gain additional magical secrets when you level up so you can learn more spells from other classes, which is absolutely beneficial for a bard with their limited pool of spells available. The School of Valor is a tanky subclass similar to a paladin sort of a style. You gain medium armor proficiency, shield proficiency, and martial weapon proficiency. Plus your bardic inspiration will become combat inspiration. So on top of being able to add that dice roll to attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws, it can now also be added to weapon damage or armor class. Plus at level six, you'll gain an extra attack as well. So if you use your first attack as a melee attack or, or ranged, you'll be able to attack again in that same turn. And that's the same for the School of Swords. You'll also gain that extra attack, except in this subclass, you're more focused on a offensive melee fighter. So you'll still gain that medium arm proficiency. You also gain scimitar proficiency as well as blade flourish. So you can use that to knock enemies off balance, but you also get the flourish attacks. Now these are special attacks that will consume your bardic inspiration to deal additional damage or additional effects. One of them being a teleport. So you can teleport to the enemies. One of them allowing you to attack two enemies that are next to each other is dependent on the different elements that you want to focus on. And you also pick a fighting style here between dueling so wielding a one-handed weapon and gaining extra damage because of that or two weapon fighting so essentially dual wielding two weapons so how do you pick between these three it's dependent on what you want to do so if you want to be more of a spell caster staying at ranged and casting spells then school of law is the way you want to go if you want to get into the thick of things potentially tank some damage and deal extra martial attacks with your extra attack then the school of valor is for you and if you want to get fancy with swords and sort of focus more on dealing damage in melee range and then casting spells secondarily then the school of swords is probably the option to go for. For the best feats here, I think for the most part, you're probably just going to go ability improvement to get your charisma up, especially for all of these skill checks that, that will help with, but also for any of your spell casting, especially if you're going school of law, it's absolutely beneficial. If you've gone the school of valor or school of swords, then warcaster isn't a bad option to give you an extra shopping grasp opportunity attack if something moves out of your melee range. You also gain advantage on saving throws when you're concentrating on a spell, which a lot of the time you probably will be concentrating on a spell. So it's also a good option but you could maybe go the magic initiates to grab either warlock or sorcerer spells here and cantrips because you do share a charisma modifier with them so you could grab something like eldritch blast in the warlock line or something like that but i think for probably the most part unless you are desperate to get more spells which in that case you would have gone school of law and you'll get those anyway as you level up so you'll probably just go ability improvement here to get your charisma up unless you've found a better option here which we did touch on best spells and cantrips here vicious mockery is an amazing cantrip that does a tiny little bit of damage but you're mainly using it to give an enemy disadvantage on their next attack roll so if there's a big major threat in that encounter potentially a boss encounter using vicious mockery to give them disadvantage on their attacks is absolutely huge i also am a fan of cloud of daggers as it's a great area of control spell that deals slashing damage to enemies in an area heat metal is also great because it'll deal damage and actually have them drop their weapon as well a lot of the time tasha's hideous laughter is great to get an enemy out of an encounter for a period of time also if you're looking for more spells check out my spells video which goes through a bunch of some of the best spells in the game so you can help you make that decision some class tips for the bard to finish off so when you're using bardic inspiration on an ally 
right, make sure you've gone into their spell book and ticked the reaction option so that you don't waste that inspiration on something unnecessary, especially if you want to save it for a certain type of role, like whether it's be an attack roll or a damage roll if you're School of Valor or something like that. So just make sure that you've ticked those options. All bards will also get Song of Rest, which is a, essentially it's a free short rest. So after certain encounters, you can use it once per long rest. So you essentially have three short rests before you need to long rest as having a bard in your party. And this is really beneficial for classes that gain things back on short rests. So you've got that option as well. And as you level up, you will gain magical secrets as a bard, which allows you to grab different spells from different classes. I reckon you should take Hex here because Hex is a fantastic spell that you can cast as a bonus action, which is sometimes difficult to use as a bard. And you could use that to cast on an enemy just to deal extra necrotic damage when you hit them. This is great for any of the subclasses where they're using martial weapons or spells to deal damage, also fantastic. And because of the bard's flexibility, they are one of the best classes for multi-classing, right? I'll have a full video coming out about multi-classing as well, but I just wanted to touch on it here that they are fantastic because they've got a charisma modifier, which is shared with a warlock and a sorcerer and some other classes as well. Plus they're a class that doesn't gain a heap of like class features or subclass features across their levels. It's mostly at level three or level six. So you've got the ability to say hit level three and then multi-class into something else or same at like level six, you can then multi-class into something else. So playing as a ranger is a little different in Baldur's Gate 3 than it is in regular D&D. Larian have made a couple of changes to the class to make it a bit more viable, but for the most part here, you've got access to ranged martial attacks with like bows and crossbows. You've got access to a bunch of melee weapons that you can deal in close range. And even if you pick the Beastmaster subclass, you've got beasts that you can summon to help you in combat. Plus you can cast some basic spells to sort of help you in combat as well. But for the most part here, you're really focusing on either doing range damage with a bow or crossbow, or melee damage with some sort of a melee weapon because you've got proficiency in simple weapon and martial weapons, you've got a huge breadth of stuff that's available to you. Now you also gain a favored enemy and a natural explorer option as a ranger. Now the favored enemy will essentially allow you to pick an option that will give you a certain proficiency and potentially allow you to learn a new spell. Really here you can pick whatever you feel like and you'll get access to multiple of these as you level up. The one that I would sort of avoid is ranger knight because you gain heavy armor proficiency which essentially means that if you wear heavy armor you don't gain any dex modifier from the armor you're wearing and as rangers you're going to have an extremely high dexterity so it's not really viable for you to be wearing heavy armor unless you specifically want to go down that route and for natural explorer it's the same you'll gain multiple of these as you level up you could go something like beast tamer to get fine familiar so you could summon a familiar to either help you in combat or help you in sort of the sandbox urban tracker gives you sleight of hand proficiencies so you don't have to worry about picking that up in terms of your skills or you could pick up a resistance type i personally would grab poison as there are a ton of poison traps in this game and just areas that are covered in poison clouds so if you want to be able to sort of avoid those areas or even just like walk through poison then definitely grab that option now you also gain an extra attack at level five regardless of your subclass choice which is really valuable for rangers because you gives you a bit more prowess in either ranged or melee combat compared to say a rogue because they don't get that extra attack whereas they get additional damage with sneak damage you instead get an extra attack to use for those turns. So let's make a ranger. Now, picking a race here, your roleplay considerations, obviously, so pick whatever you like, but you've already got a bunch of proficiencies just via this class. You've got light, medium armor, simple weapons, martial weapons. So you don't really need to pick a race, but that gives you additional proficiencies. You could consider something for dark vision, which is hugely important for a ranger. So you could either go the elf, the tiefling, the half elf, or the dwarf, or if you want superior dark vision, which I would highly recommend as a ranger, then go the drow as well. You've already got like longbow, shortbow proficiencies anyway because of those martial weapons that you've got access to. So going something like an elf to pick that up isn't really important. So you've got that freedom. For the best skills here, I would be focusing on the dexterity skills. So acrobat, sleight of hand, and stealth. They're all really valuable. Also don't pick up sleight of hand if you've gone the urban tracker because you've already got proficiencies in that. So you can then spend those skill points elsewhere. But you've also got that freedom right now. In terms of your backgrounds, you'd go the charlatan, the criminal, urchin, something like that, or sort of whatever is your roleplay desires. For your ability points, the main one here is dexterity because you're going to be using dex not only for melee weapons, but for ranged weapons. Constitution is always important for that extra little bit of health and wisdom is your spell casting modifier. So you definitely want to get your wisdom to 14 as well for any of the spells that you do cast. At level three, you will pick a subclass. Now there's three options here between the Beastmaster, the Hunter and the Gloom Stalker. The Beastmaster will enhance your ranger by allowing you to summon a companion. This could be a bear, a boar, a 
dire wolf, a wolf, or a wolf spider. At level 5, they also get enhanced to deal additional damage, but for the most part, that's the unique part of a Beastmaster Ranger, is that you'll have an additional companion, which will be consuming some of that melee space and sort of playing as a bit of a frontliner to take some damage, and you can summon them outside of combat to sort of bring them into any encounter. A hunter will essentially focus on being a hunter, but you get different actions that can be performed during combat, say like Horde Breaker, so you can target two creatures standing close to each other, attacking them in quick succession. This is a bit of a slower subclass as it only really excels after level 11 when you get access to like Whirlwind Attack and Volley for additional attack options, but they're not a bad option. I would just not necessarily recommend them compared to either the Beastmaster or the Gloomstalker. So the Gloomstalker gets enhanced mobility plus bonus damage on your first turn, and you also gain Dread Ambush, so you gain plus three to your initiative, and on your first turn of combat, you have additional movement speed, but you can also deal an attack that does an additional 1d8 of damage. So while you're leveling up here, I'd probably either go the Beastmaster or the Gloomstalker, as they have the most like easy benefits to understand and also get value out of as you're leveling up. And then if you wanted to go, say, the Hunter, you could respec into them later on, once you've sort of hit that like level 11-ish mark where you can get the benefits of the Hunter class. But the Gloomstalker and the Beastmaster get benefits that are much more noticeable immediately compared to the Hunter. When picking feats here, ability improvement to increase your dex is probably going to be the first feat that you do pick up here to get that to 18 and potentially potentially get either your constitution or wisdom on that next positive number or even number. And then depending on what you're focusing on, you could maybe go something like sharpshooter if you're focusing on range to increase your range damage. Maybe mobile or alert could also be useful. Mobile for movement speed and alert so you can't be surprised and increase your initiative. However, if you've gone a gloom stalker, then that's not as important. But I'd probably just be focusing on the ability improvement as a ranger just to increase your damage with dexterity based attacks. You don't have access to a whole lot of spells and cantrips as a ranger. You won't be using them heaps like inside combat really. For the most part you'll be using those martial attacks and they're sort of supplementary to your overall kit. For cantrips here like you've got true strike which you won't really use very much because it's often better to just have an attack roll rather than give yourself advantage on the next attack. Hunter's Mark is definitely one I'd be using and picking up regularly so essentially what you can do here is as a bonus action you can put Hunter's Mark on an enemy and anytime you attack that enemy you'll add an extra 1d6 to that damage roll and if that target dies, you can then move it to another target. Now, it's not heaps of damage, it's only a 1d6, but any additional damage is good, and as a ranger, you won't necessarily be using that bonus action in any specific way, unless maybe you're dual wielding and using it as an offhand attack, so if you're focusing on the ranged kit, then Hunter's Mark is valuable for that, but it's only a little bit of damage, right? You've also got Good Berry, which is a cheap healing action as a bonus action, so you can use Good Berry outside of combat to give yourself the berries, and then you can actually consume the berries in combat. Hail of Thorns isn't a bad damage option either and I also do like lightning action as well which you can use so lightning action will deal like lightning damage to enemies when you hit them with it it's also unique to the ranger as well some class tips for the ranger now there's a lot of setup that you can do with the ranger right if you are a beast master you should be summoning your beast outside of combat so they're already available once you do enter combat you've also got high dexterity and high stealth so you should consider entering combat from a stealth position which will definitely be valuable to you you can also use your familiar out outside of combat to do various things, like say if you're using a cat to get into areas or something. Regardless of what sort of a weapon you're focusing on, make sure you're using finesse weapons. So finesse weapons will allow you to use your dexterity modifier or your strength modifier, depending on what is higher. And as a ranger, your dex modifier will definitely be higher. So just pay attention to the weapon descriptions here, make sure they say finesse. The lower amount of spell slots available to a ranger and spells in general definitely mean it's not the main focus of their kit. It's, it's really the martial attack that you're going to focus on. They also have a low amount of just general spells available to them. So they're more of a supplementary feature. So when you're thinking about what you're doing with your turns, I would consider attacking first because you get that extra attack as well before using spells. They should be sort of the supplementary fallback option if there isn't a good attack option that's available to you. And also don't forget to reapply and activate Hunter's Mark on enemies because once you've used it and that enemy dies, you can then reapply it as a bonus action to someone else without consuming another spell slot. 
The Sorcerer is an interesting class because they are similar to a wizard in that for the most part, they're going to be a glass cannon ranged spellcaster with low HP, typically low armor class as well. And you're going to be attacking from range with cantrips and spells. The difference with a Sorcerer, however, is that you can't prepare spells. You can't change the spells you have active. You also can't learn spells from scrolls. And the trade-off is that you instead gain access to sorcery points and meta magic. Sorcery points are the resource that you'll use to essentially add those meta magic effects to your spells. And this could be something like, say, meta magic twin spells, which a spell that will only target one creature can now target an additional creature, or you could add other effects to it, essentially increasing the distance of the spell, potentially turning it from an action to a bonus action, or a number of other things. But as charisma is their main modifier, they also make great talkers for your, say, role-playing methods if you do want to use a lot of persuasion, deception, intimidation, those sort of skills as well. And they do have access to a decent amount of spell slots, but a small amount of spells in their arsenal so you really need to be careful about the spells you do pick as a sorcerer because you want to make sure they're actually useful so let's make a sorcerer and we'll start with the best races now role play considerations here obviously but as a sorcerer same as the wizard your movement speed and dark vision don't matter as much dark vision does definitely matter don't get me wrong but movement speed doesn't as much because you won't move heaps because you'll always be in range and you can use misty step if you wanted to go that route but i would consider going something that maybe has a proficiency that maybe you want probably not an armor proficiency unless you do want to go that route but maybe something that say like a human or a half elf that has shield proficiency so you can gain some extra armor class from having a shield equipped that doesn't technically count as armor so you can still use things like mage armor and etc when picking skills as a sorcerer i'd be looking at the charisma skills so deception intimidation performance and persuasion and same for the backgrounds you want to be looking at backgrounds that give you these sort of a skills but you can sort of pick depending on your role playing choices there for ability points i would be looking at getting your charisma to 17, getting your dex and con to at least 14 and getting one of them to 15. Probably your dexterity because you can actually get your health up via a subclass we're going to talk about in a second, which is probably one of the better subclasses for the sorcerer. So getting your dex to say 15 and con to 14 is probably the safer route. So when you're picking those subclasses in character creation, you pick from three, wild magic, draconic bloodline and storm sorcery. Now, as a whole, like across the board, a sorcerer will play exactly the same regardless of your subclass choice. It does just change small elements of the kit. Wild Magic, for example, gives you Tides of Chaos. So when you activate, you can gain advantage on your next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. But this will in turn add the chances of your Wild Magic surge to actually happen. Now, what Wild Magic is, is it is essentially an effect that can either buff you, it can debuff you, it can do all sorts of other chaotic things, it can turn you into a sheep and god knows what else so that randomness may be fun or sound fun but it can also lose your fights if say you just get really unlucky and a lot of these bad negative wild magic effects happen draconic bloodline gives you a higher health pool for every sorcerer level you gain plus it also increases your default armor class you also get to pick a draconic ancestry which will give you a buff to a specific element type and as well as an additional spell this is a fantastic subclass one because you get an extra spell and the spells available to a sorcerer are typically pretty limited but also because as you level up you will deal additional damage with that damage type so let's say for example if you picked say the red type which will give you access to burning hands but as you hit level six it will also increase the amount of damage you do with fire spells and fireball being my favorite spell it's just win-win for that reason so consider picking an option here based on a damage type that you want to do and then make sure that you pick corresponding spells that suit that damage type storm sorcery gives you access to Tempest Magic. So after you cast a spell, you gain fly as a bonus action, allowing you to move around the battlefield without actually receiving opportunity attacks. Essentially, this takes the place of like Misty Step. Say, for example, if you don't want to use Misty Step. So when you're picking spells, if you've picked Storm Sorcery, just consider that the Misty Step sort of becomes irrelevant to you because you can move via just your actual subclass features. But then you also can gain additional damage of Lightning and Thunder damage as you level up as this class. So consider that as well. So when picking a subclass here, I personally think the Draconic Bloodline is the best for a raw damage dealing sorcerer. You could go Storm Sorcery for a little bit more flexibility if you want to specialize in Lightning and Thunder and also be able to fly like each turn so you can move around freely. Wild Magic might be the most chaotic, essentially fun subclass, but it's worth considering that if you are new to D&D or Baldur's Gate 3, that sometimes those effects won't actually help you and they will definitely hinder your progress if the wrong Wild Magic effect goes off in certain encounters. The best feats for a sorcerer are basically just ability improvement to increase your charisma.
charisma because in turn then that will overall increase obviously your skill checks but also your damage because you're using charisma as your spell casting modifier and you're just going to be casting spells almost solely as a sorcerer so it's definitely the better option if you want something else to consider you could go elemental adept especially if you've gone the draconic bloodline because then you can match that element type with your draconic bloodline to remove resistances that enemies have on that type as well as slightly increase your overall damage output because you can't roll a one on spells of that type so it's definitely something to consider you could also maybe go the magic initiatives to grab say either the warlock or the bard cantrips and spells here because you do have a matching charisma spell casting modifier with them though you're probably better off multi-classing into those classes if that's the route you wanted to go the best spells and cantrips i would advise you to check out my best spells video which goes through these in detail but in terms of cantrips for your damage cantrips firebolt acid splash ray of frost roll just like good options plus with meta magic you can add additional targets to them as well for your spells one thing that i would always grab is magic missile because it is a spell that never misses and deals consistent good damage as also can hit multiple targets chromatic orb is also great because you can tailor the damage type based on enemy enemy and enemy you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, don't hurt yourself. Enemy resistances. So you can right click and examine and base your actual damage output on their resistances. You've also got other options that like in terms of damage options that I would relate to whatever you are focusing on. Say if you've got a draconic bloodline and you're focusing on fire damage, I'd be picking the fire spell. Same as if you're focusing on poison damage, I'd be picking things like ray of frost, cold, ice knife, that sort of a thing. So consider that. But you've got a bunch of options and you can sort of pick and choose based on that as well. Sorcerer class tips. Number one is the mage armor spell i wouldn't grab that as a sorcerer because you have a limited amount of spells that are available to you and using mage armor will actually not only you know it obviously consumes a spell slot when you use it but because you don't have a whole lot of actual spell pool available to you consuming or using mage armor as one of those will limit your other options and you can get the exact same benefits from the elixir of bark skin which will then increase your armor class to 16 anyway so you've got other ways you can increase your armor class you've also got other characters that can say cast like shield of faith or something on your sorcerer plus if you've gone the draconic bloodline as well mage armor isn't as useful misty step is a great pickup for a sorcerer that isn't a storm sorcery but if you are a storm sorcerer then i wouldn't pick that up because your fly is essentially better your meta magic effects is the core part of a sorcerer kit and using those effectively in combat will see you have a great amount of success when you're leveling up you'll be able to pick different ones of these meta magic spell types as you sort of level up you'll get more available to you but the best ones that i want to call out here is meta magic twin spells which we touched on earlier earlier to allow you to turn a single target spell into adding an additional target you've also got meta magic quicken spell so spells that cost an action can now be cast as a bonus action instead so you can essentially just cast two spells that turn meta magic distance spell will allow you to increase the range of spells by 50 percent plus melee spells as well so say if you're stuck on a high ground and the enemies are a fair distance away you can increase the distance of your spells meta magic careful spell is also great so allies can automatically succeed saving throws against spells that require them so if you've say got something like fireball for example right you're going to throw it on your melee characters using careful spell will allow you to stop them from actually receiving that damage a bit similar to the subtle spell that the wizard gets access to but you'll actually use your sorcery points and meta magic to get that sort of same effect but essentially that's everything you need to know for the sorcerer let me know your thoughts in the comments down below thank you guys for watching this video till the end thank you to our members for supporting the channel my name is norza and i hope you have a great day